eventually they, he cornered him in an alley and Moses pulled a, an axe of some sort out of his pants and, st and went to attack this constable, uh, who was then forced to fire two shots at him. It's very different than anything else we've ever seen. And the first reason for that is, you know, his total sentence was something ridiculous like 2,410 years. Yeah, um, 2,410 years, yeah. which is unbelievable, I mean. What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Wide Awake Podcast. My name is Joshua Rubin, and I'm your host. Are you ready? Today, my guest is Nicole Engelbrecht. She is the host of the podcast True Crime South Africa, and she researches each case herself using media coverage, trial footage, social media resources, and often by talking to some of the individuals involved. Hi, Josh. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. That was well, a mouthful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually got it from your, from yeah. your site. Yeah. I, I'm sure you noticed. Yeah, I did. It sounded familiar. So today we're going to be talking about true crime mm -hmm. and in specific, a man called Moses Sitoli. Um, let me tell you a little bit about him. So Moses Sitoli is a South African serial killer who committed the ABC murders. Uh, Sitoli murdered at least 37 women and one toddler between 16 July 1994 and 6 November 1995. He did a bunch of other stuff as well, but we'll get into that as we go along. So just to start off, I mean, why were the murders called the ABC murders? So that was an interesting one. And that was obviously, that was the moniker that was given to the series by the press. But it was actually quite, as I started researching this case, I realized it was, it was a bit inaccurate. So ABC stands for the areas that Moses Sotole killed in. It's uh, Attridgeville, Boxburg, and Cleveland. And uh, as legend has it, as the moniker was created, supposedly he killed in that order, starting in Attridgeville, then in Boxburg, and then in Cleveland. But uh, when I started researching and I actually drew up the timeline of, of the victims, that was actually not the case. It was more like the CBA killer. So, <laughs> but that doesn't yeah, sound as it, good. It's just not nearly as catchy. So yeah. clearly, you know, that's that's why the media went with ABC. And I mean, you've looked into many serial killers. This is kind of your thing, you know. Mm. It's what you're known for in South Africa. Yeah. And um, I want to know from you, what do you think turns someone into a serial killer? So I think it's a, it's a question that a lot of people have debated over the years and it's always people want to know, is it nature or is it nurture? Is it, you know, how these people, are these people born or are they made that way? And I think what I've discovered after, you know, three, four years of podcasting now and looking into some of these guys and women is that it's a combination of both. It's a lot of these guys, unfortunately, do have some abuse in their childhoods. And that when combined, you know, I mean, uh, many people suffered abuse, sadly, when they were children, and they don't go on to become serial killers, the vast majority of them. But the guys that do often have other sort of circumstances around them or, you know, innate character, I wouldn't call them flaws, but innate characteristics that combined with that abuse they may have suffered results in this. So we see these guys developing things like personality disorders. Almost all uh, serial killers that have been convicted and studied to some extent psychologically have been shown to have certain types of, uh, whether it's narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, and the nature of those types of personality disorders when combined with past abuse, when combined with certain often sexual fetish fetishes, all it really takes is a bit of a trigger. And that's really what we see with these guys. So it's it's really just a, a really sort of fine line combination between that nature and nurture that that creates these these killers. And I mean, when it comes to Moses Satoli, um, I know I read that he had quite a bad childhood. Mm. Um, and I don't know mm. if that was something that was proven or if that was something that he said. Mm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about his circumstances growing up? Sure. So Moses had a, from records, had a pretty poor childhood. He had, um, you know, very sad situations. So he was born in the 60s. And he was the fourth of six children uh, to his parents. And then his dad passed away when he was 10 years old. 
and his mom found herself in a situation where she was unable to care for these six children. And in a what I can only assume was a very desperate move, she abandoned all six children at a police station. She told the children, tell the police officers both your parents are dead and they'll take care of you. And she left them there. So Moses' siblings and him were split up. They were all sent to different orphanages across the country. Uh, Moses ended up initially in an orphanage in KwaZulu-Natal. He says that uh, he suffered quite significant abuse in that home. He said that he was sexually abused, physically abused, and emotionally abused. He ran away from there when he was 13 years old. And he says he made his way more than 600 kilometers as a 13-year-old back to Johannesburg to find his mother. And when he found her, she rejected him once again. And he was basically on his own. So he then went and lived with an older brother who'd, who'd set up his own, own house. So very, very difficult childhood. And certainly that rejection by the mother figure is significant. But as you mentioned in your question, it's often difficult with these guys to know how much of what they're saying is factual and how much is them already understanding that they need to build some sort of defense for their actions and perhaps garner some sympathy. We know that, you know, records and Moses' siblings would agree that, you know, certain these things did happen. They wouldn't be able to definitely say that he was abused in the home, of course. That's, you know, but I think that what's most important here is not disproving him. We can have empathy for the boy that Moses was as, you know, who, who, what he experienced as a child. That can happen simultaneously with us not excusing his actions as an adult. You know, um, so what he runs through, however accurate it is, is, is really tragic and really horrific. Um, you know, and I think perhaps that relationship with his mom, that dynamic may have played into his crimes in the future. Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, I mean, it's not hard to believe because we know that a lot of these things do happen. Of course. Um, and especially in South Africa, there's quite a, um, you know, it's quite common for those kind of things to happen to kids, uh, mm. to be abandoned or to be abused. Mm. And um, I mean, I wanted to know, do you know anything about his parents? So not much, unfortunately, and that's, you know, sort of telling of the time. We were in apartheid South Africa when Moses was born. Um, not very good record keeping around people of color in our country, um, you know, because they were so pushed to the side and not given the types of resources that everyone else had. And we don't know why his, his dad passed away. We do believe it was illness. Um, and there's really not much about his mom. His mom seemed to have sort of disappeared in the interim. But between that time when he last saw her, when she was when he was 13, uh, and when he was arrested, she seems to have disappeared. So there's a very good chance she passed away in that, in that period. And really, you know, I think his parents were not unlike most South African families of people of color at that time, really struggling, you know, hardly any access to resources and really made to be, you know, second grade citizens in their own country. What kind of started off his killing spree? Do you know Do you know much about that? Like, when mm. did he decide to take the leap and commit his first murder? Or was that his first crime, murder? Uh, when he was 23 years old, he committed what is on record as his first rape. So he started, as many of these sexually motivated serial killers do, he started with rape and escalated to murder. And for Moses, the way that went was... By the time he was imprisoned for the first time in the mid-80s, mid to late 80s, he had raped three women, but only his third victim had actually opened the case. Again, um, you know, a sign of the times, these were all black women who did not feel comfortable coming forward to the police with their cases. So the third young lady who was raped by him opened a case and he was arrested, tried and convicted. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. 
And Moses maintained, and even up until his, his second arrest after the murders, that he did not rape that woman. And he, he then, in his mind, this so-called unjust arrest and conviction became his, his almost his driving force. While he was sitting in prison, he ended up serving seven of the 10 years. And while he was sitting in prison, this almost started brewing inside him, this anger toward women. So this is how Moses describes it. He describes everything he did after he was released after prison, uh, from prison for his first conviction was because of the single victim who he claims and, you know, wrongly accused him. And really that is not true because if we look at what he had done to his first three victims, there were already signs that he was escalating to murder. The three women gave identical, you know, the, the first two, even though they hadn't come forward at the time when he was arrested after the murders, they did come forward. And they gave almost identical accounts of what he had done to them. And many of the things that he did in those rapes, he repeated in the murders. So there was very clearly a cycle building up there. And, you know, he maybe felt better blaming, the, you know, his third rape victim for his eventual crimes. But really, that was very clearly not, not what happened. And I mean, how would he lure these women? How would he get them to trust him and come with him? Was he having like romantic relationships with them already? Or was he kind of luring them under false pretenses? So it was a range of things, but his main modus operandi was a, a tactic that many South African serial killers use, and it's actually quite unique to South Africa. It's, it's unique to sort of countries where the unemployment rate is very high, and that is these fake job offers. Because there are so many people who are desperate and looking for jobs, it's far easier to get someone to go with you because, you know, if, if there's a, a possibility that they could be offered a, a job, they're, they're willing to risk it. And that is how he started luring his victims. There were the occasional victims that he had some sort of personal connection to. Uh, one of his rape victims in the beginning was the sister of his girlfriend, for instance. Um, you know, and with, occasionally he would get close to these women, but that happened very rarely. So, you know, he was quite smart in how he went about. He approached strangers. And for the most part, um, you know, there was a bit of build up in the, in the days before. So he would make contact with his victim often, and then he would set up an appointment. So it wasn't, you know, walking up to someone in the street and saying, I've got a job for you, come with me. That did happen on occasion, but the vast majority, there were multiple points of contact. Um, you know, he would uh, meet them, offer them a job, set up a, a time and day. And that also made his victims feel more comfortable because this man wasn't dragging them off to a fault there and then. He was setting up an appointment with them. And he was well-dressed, he was well-spoken, he was charming and all of these things. So that was really how he managed to lure so many women. And I mean, the organization he had was fake, right? Mm, um, and it was called Youth Against Human Abuse. So I think from what I read, it, this fake organization uh, focused mainly on child abuse. Mm. And um, do you think that he decided to do that because of... Uh, the circumstances he had growing up? It's entirely possible. Um, you know, that may have been in his mind, but I think the fact that we know that he'd set up this, that this organization wasn't real. So, you know, it was an organization in name alone that allowed him to get access to places where women predominantly worked. And that was, that was one of the, the, the ways he used the so-called organization was to get access to creches, to, um, mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of organizations like that where he knew women worked. And then on the other side of that, he used it. I mean, he had letterheads drawn up and, you know, he was, he was quite this advanced. Was yeah. yeah, he was quite advanced in this ruse, uh, which makes sense, you know, why so many victims fell for it. 
And that just gave him this added bits of credibility to show, you know, his his victims, well, here's the organization that I've got. I want you to come work for them. You know, so that's really where, you know, I guess in in his mind, it may have had some link to his own abuse. Um, but I really do think that that organization was just a tool for him. And also it's like, you kind of wouldn't think someone is up to anything sinister, mm. you know, if they're kind of advocating for mm. um, child abuse. Sure, it's it's the best place for predators to hide. And, you know, that's where many predators hide, unfortunately, is between the, you know, behind the guise of being the, um, you know, the NPO and fighting for children and mm. all of these things. So, yeah. And I mean, is there any information about his life at the time? So during these killings, they, they spanned roughly a year, right? Mm. Um, and in right. that time, I mean, he killed, I think I mentioned 37 people. Correct, yes. Um, what was he doing at that time besides for, uh, obviously, mm. his, the attacks? So he was living with um, his wife slash girlfriend. Um, he'd, he'd had a daughter with her. And he was living with her family. He was initially helping her brother to work on cars. Her brother was a mechanic. And at one point he said to them, you know, this was just before he started his murders, um, when he was released from prison, because his his wife had actually met him in prison. Uh, she was visiting her other brother who was in prison, and she met Moses while he was serving his his rape charge. And um, so he'd he'd moved in with them after he'd he'd left, uh, got out got out of prison on parole, and helped with the cars for a little while, and then said, okay. We've, we've got a child now, um, and it was interesting how the beginning of his murders almost seemed to coincide with his child being born, which is quite a stressful event. And we know sometimes serial killers are triggered by stressful events in their life. And what he would then do was every single day he would get dressed up. He would, you know, um, put on his smartest pants, his smartest button-up shoe, uh, shirt, take a newspaper as though he was going to look at the classifieds, which is how everyone found jobs at that time, and leave the house. And he would be out job hunting the entire day. And what he was really doing was hunting for victims. And at one point, he did actually get a job. He was working at a gas company in uh, Pretoria. And at that time, we see his... Although that whole ABC moniker doesn't include the Pretoria area, there were actually many victims in the Pretoria area. And that happened while he was working at this gas company in Pretoria. When it comes to the murders, how would he kind of kill his victims? So his method of choice was strangulation. Um, he would tie the women up in very specific ways. He often raped them before he murdered them. And for him, the strangulation almost seemed to form part of the sexual act. Um, so he would often rape his victims from behind and he would have the method of strangulation around their neck and strangle them as he was raping them. So it would sort of be, um, you know, both happening at the same time. And that was... You could quite clearly see once police were able to understand which victims were killed when, because a lot of his victims were very decomposed when they were found. So, the, you know, figuring out when they were killed and what order was difficult. But once they managed to do that based on when these people had disappeared, you could actually see the progression in his modus operandi and the way he was killing. So he started with, with manual strangulation, strangulation by hand, then he moved up to using um, parts of their clothing, of the victim's clothing. He would use either their underwear, their bras, belts, uh, bra straps, that sort of thing. And eventually he figured out that if he used a garrote, so a, a, a stick wound into the material that he was using to strangle his victims, he could actually prolong the process. So he could twist the, the strangulation device uh, to cut off the victim's ear. She would go fall unconscious but not die. And then he would release it and let her regain consciousness again. And this towards the end was what clearly fulfilled, started fulfilling his fantasy because he had this ultimate control over his victims. 
That is pretty shocking. Um, mm. And I know that there's been obviously a debate recently. And I think as a podcaster, both of us are podcasters, looking at these cases, often we can kind of get separated from them a little bit and go like, this is just a story, you know, but obviously mm. this is something that really happened. And there's a yeah. lot of victims that, you know, families that have had their lives changed by these kind of things. Yeah. Um, and I know that you focus quite heavily on the victims in, mm. in your work, which I think is important because I think, you know, when it comes to the Netflix documentaries that come out recently about Jeffrey Dahmer, mm. we see a lot of the families speaking out against it, saying that, you know, obviously people are interested in this kind of stuff and yeah. uh, that this, you know, it's, it's always happened. People mm. have always gravitated towards the killer. Mm. Um but I think it's also important, although we are talking about the killer, to talk about some of the victims. Mm. Um, I wanted to know, do you know much about the victims? Are there any cases that stand out as being different to the others? So I think for me, the probably one of the saddest parts about this case, as well as most other serial, case, serial killer cases, is that so many of these victims don't get identified. And most of, of Moses's victims were young women in their 20s. I think his oldest victim was about 43. Um, but that so, seemed to be sort of a, um, a deviation from his norm. So very young ladies who some of them had young children and really just trying to make their way in the world. And I think it's really important for us if we want to get into some of these victims' minds of what and what they may have been experiencing at that time is to remember the, the period of time in which this happened in South Africa. So it was 94, 95. And we know that that is when South Africa uh, apartheid had fallen. We were electing a new government. Our democracy was being born. But there was something else happening as well. And that's something that these, these victims would have probably celebrated but, but also became their downfall was so much, you know, during the apartheid era, people, people of color were not allowed to move freely in our country. So once apartheid fell and that, you know, past laws fell and all of that sort of nonsense was no longer an issue, people were allowed to move freely to find work. So these young women were probably, you can ju I can just imagine them feeling this intense sense of the possibilities in their lives are now endless. Mm. You know, the chains that have been binding them have fallen. They have, are now able to move in society, you know, as the, freely as they should be and go and look for work and... You can just, you can almost imagine that sense, you, that palpable sense of, you know, now is my time. And I think for each one of these numerous victims, and I do personally think there's more, more victims than, than we were recorded for him. I think I read that he claimed that there was double the amount of yes, victims. Yes, correct. Yeah, I, so I think that the fair amount is probably halfway between that. I would say he was closer to about 50 victims. Um, but, you know, we can't prove that. Mm. You know, but, and I think that's, if we want to put ourselves into the, the minds of, of each of these victims who all had a name and not all of them got their names and identities back, they set out that morning from their homes with the hope in their heart that this was a new South Africa they were entering into. They were... About to get a job, about possibly. About to get a job, about to, you know, be able to feed their families. The world was their oyster. And then they came across this predator who, in their last moments, and sometimes it's very difficult to put yourself in that victim's shoes in their last moments... But the horror that those women must have been experiencing in those last moments of what he was doing to them, you know, it's there. There is no amount of present time that will ever validate what those victims and their families experienced. And I think you mentioned that some of them weren't identified. That's correct. Um, I think that's probably, you know, going through something like that as a family is tough enough. Mm. Um, you know, raising a kid or 
your your mother maybe was the victim, mm-hmm. and they get murdered. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's tough, but I think there is a way to heal and recover from that. Mm. Um, but I think when a body is never identified or you don't have that kind of closure of yeah. burying your loved one, um, that sometimes can be almost the worst part of always. Mm. It, it's always open ended. Absolutely. It's yeah. Like, was she a victim or wh- mm. where did she go? Did she abandon me? Mm. Um, Absolutely. Has, yeah. has any of the family spoken out about their experience? So not in this, in this specific case, but, you know, I have had the pleasure of connecting with many victims' families through my podcast journey and victims of missing people, you know, some who have been missing for 15, 20 years. And it's exactly what you describe, you know, that it's almost knowing what happened is horrible and terrible, but not knowing what happened. And that daily, you know, wrenching feeling of should I be searching or am I wasting my time, you know, that is almost worse than knowing that your loved one was murdered. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a complicated grief because these people don't know if they can grieve. They don't know if they can move on. If they do move on, they feel like they're letting their loved ones down. You know, so I can imagine that those families who sadly still to this day, I think there were four or five victims that were not identified, um, they they still wonder. They, they, you know, and that has a generational impact. You know, it's not, it doesn't just stop in that, you know, that time when it happened in a family. It that Those ripples pass down generations over and over and over again. Um, you know, so really the, the horrible acts that he committed are, are probably still impacting families today. He wouldn't just leave it there a lot of the time. Uh, I heard that he would often taunt the victim's families. Mm. Um, I heard that one of the, the ways he would do that was by phoning them. Mm. Um, was that the only way or? So he he did f- phone a few of the families on occasion and these were often the ones where he'd had multiple contact points with the victims. So he'd phone them on their cell phones while they were at home or on their the house phones. And when he had contact with when he had a contact number for the family, he did seem to enjoy afterwards. I think in about in two or three cases they were able to confirm that he had phoned on multiple occasions the one victim's grandmother. He phoned even a few months after her body was found. Um, and you know, there's that sadist side to that. But I also wondered, you know, knowing how later in later on, as we'll discuss, he contacted journalists, I wondered whether that wasn't his way of trying to get his victims found faster. You know, because we know that a I lot think of... maybe he felt bad or... No, I don't think he felt bad at all. Um, I think a, so a lot of serial killers enjoy the attention that comes in the media. And when they're almost disappointed when they kill someone and that person doesn't get found for a few months, you know, so they will phone into police or they'll phone into victims' families and just to push that process along. And I think for Moses, that's actually what this was about. He probably did get a bit of a kick off taunting the families, but for him it was more about pushing you know, so that these these victims would be found so he could continue getting the notori- notoriety he was getting in the media. Yeah, I think that is a driving factor for a lot of these people. Mm. You know, they just want to be seen, they want to be heard. Yeah. And um, I mean, would he, would he tell the families who he was? He wouldn't so, say his name, I'm sure. So he used multiple aliases, even with his victims. And um, that was usually the names he used when he called. But these family members were able to identify his voice. Um, later on when after police had arrested him. Mm. Um, you know, and then also some family members recognized his voice from when he'd phoned to set up the appointment. And, you know, th- so those were like significant mistakes that he was making, um, which, which should have eventually led to his arrest. I think often that is the unwinding, is the, the need for recognition mm. um, of, of a lot of these serial killers and murderers is that... Mm. They don't want to just leave it as we've done the crime. They want the recognition for doing the crime. Mm, um, absolutely. I mean, what was the reaction from the public? Because I know that, you know, we've seen stories like Jack the Ripper and uh, the, the countries kind of get this like, the country kind of goes into meltdown in a way mm. where everyone's like, am I going to be next? Or, 
is he still around? Or, you, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what's yeah. going to happen next? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so what was the reaction from the general public in South Africa? And was the story only in South Africa or did it kind of go overseas as well? So I think at the, the time that it happened in South Africa, it was such a, a, tur- a turbulent time to begin with, you know, that there was this already this heightened sense of energy in our country. I mean, even uh, President Mandela, he wasn't president at the time, but he'd been released. He made an appeal to for information to to um, catch th- this killer, you know, and people were definitely afraid. Um, I think the mistake that people make, though, and that was certainly, there were certain sectors of our population who believed, okay, well, it's actually not my problem because he's only killing certain types of women. Mm. Um, because most of his victims were black, or all of his victims black were black females, women. Black yeah. females, correct, yeah. And, you know, so white females, white males, black males may have been putting their guard down, and that is a very big mistake to make in, in serial killer cases, because especially in South Africa, because we've been taught this idea that everyone go, that serial killers always go after the same type of person, and that is not always true. Often it's an opportunity thing. Uh, Moses did, but, you know, there are many serial killers in our country that have targeted men, women of all races, of all ages, you know. So really at the time, it it was definitely a sense of fear, but I also think that there were so many things going on at the time that this only really came into the public consciousness when he was, you know, up to 20 victims already. You know, um, and that also spoke to the fact that we were still very much in a place in South Africa where a black female being killed would not make news. Yeah, I think it it does say a lot about the place we live in because, I mean, most of these stories like that I see on Netflix and all these documentaries, you know, Mm. some of these guys get two murders in Mm. and the whole country knows about it. Um, they, They find the pattern between the two and the link. And I mean... I think most of the most famous serial killers in the world didn't have close to the amount of victims that he had. Mm. Um, Absolutely. Which I think in South Africa, places like South Africa, it can sometimes fly under the radar because mm. of, you know, in, in townships, I know that a lot of the crimes don't go reported. And um, a lot of them kind of, even when they are reported, they're not really paid attention to. Correct. Absolutely. And I mean, we know that still happens today and even worse, you know, the situation was even worse in 1994. Mm. You know, the, the SAPS had, was making a shift from being a force, which was really targeted against people of color in our country, um, to now having to make the shift to you are a service who has to serve every South African. Mm. You know, and that was that was a big shift for many, many police officers, you know. Um, while there certainly were cases at that time where people of color were murdered and great work was done, um, we cannot deny that Moses Sotole and many of the serial killers in the early 90s got away with their crimes for far too long because they were targeting people of color. How was he eventually caught? So Moses started... He started contacting journalists. He contacted a journalist, Tamsin De Beer, and started having long, winding conversations with her, which he seemed to love. And the cops were hoping that they could use this to try and set up a sting. Uh, but at some point, Tamsin said something that he didn't like, and and that that sort of conversation ended. How it eventually ended up happening was they, he had contacted his sister. So they'd identified, they knew they had a name, they had an identicate. They just couldn't find him. Did he tell Madison his name? He did not. Tamsin. Tamsin, Tamsin. yeah. So no, he did not. So they had, what they had done is um, through all of the victims giving evidence about this this organization and uh, places that he had told, just little snippets of information that he had told people. Uh, the task force actually did quite a good job of putting together all of these pieces and saying, okay, this guy we know was in prison for rape during this period. Mm -hmm. He stays in this area and they they eventually narrowed it down to Moses Satole. And um, so after he'd contacted Tamsin De Beer and, and that had sort of fizzled out, 
Very soon after that, he contacted his sister because now he knows the cops are after him. Mm -hmm. So he's on the run. And contacted his sister, clearly still thinking that his sister would be on his side, even though he's already killed more than 30 women, and asked his sister to please arrange a gun for him and because he needed to protect himself. So he set up a, a meeting place with his sister just outside a factory, and the sister went to the cops. So the cops set up a sting where they put a constable uh, undercover in the security hut at this factory where they were meeting. And um, as Moses arrived for this meeting with his sister, they, they sprung on him. He ran, and the constable gave chase. Um, eventually, they, he cornered him in an alley, and Moses pulled a, an axe of some sort out of his pants and, st and went to attack this constable, uh, who was then forced to fire two shots at him. Um, I believe he was hit in the legs, if I'm not mistaken, the leg and the stomach. Yeah, I heard if, he was hit in the mistaken. leg, yeah. yeah. Just going back a little bit to the, the conversations he had with Tamsin. Tamsin, right? Tamsin, correct. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I keep yeah. forgetting. That's okay. Uh, so when it comes to the conversations with her, what kind of things would he talk about and were the conversations ever recorded? Yes. So I think that they did have the later conversations they recorded. Um, Tamsin was quite smart in that she tried to keep him talking. She tried to be really nice to him. He actually gave her quite a lot of information about himself. Um, he, what, he was almost desperate to prove to her that he was who he said he was. And, um, you know, so he would give her information about his past, where he'd lived, you know, his, his rape convictions. And then eventually she said to him, you've got, you, you could just be playing with me here. You need to give me some form of proof. Mm. So he actually gave her the location of a victim that the police had not yet found. And that was how they knew that it, it most certainly was him, although they'd already, already suspected that um, they went to this location and found the victim he was, he was referring to. And I, I don't know if she was, is still alive to this day. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, so I was going to ask if you've mm. ever spoken to her. No. So when I was researching the case, I found a couple of documentaries where she'd spoken about her, her time. I would, I would assume she, would, she should still be around. She's, she was relatively young. Um, so, yeah, and, and she, she spoke about the sort of surreal idea of, you know, she was, I, don't th I think on the day that the, call, the first call through, came through, she wasn't even supposed to be there. She answered someone else's phone. And the minute he heard that it was a woman, um, he latched onto her. And when she started to realize, okay, this is actually quite a big story, you know, she continued on with the, the, the whole thing mm -hmm. and, and luckily reported it to police because there was another journalist that he contacted that did not tell police that he contacted them. Because they wanted the story. Yeah, so he was trying to do a scoop and actually arranged to meet Moses. Um, luckily, Moses, for the, that journalist, Moses didn't pitch. Um, but thankfully, Tamsin was, was wise enough to let Saps know. Journalism is a funny thing because mm. it can, like, how far do you go for a story? Mm. And uh, in that case, I mean, that's, I mean, that's unbelievable. Mm. I, I've known people, like, I've done things as well where mm. you kind of, you really want to hold on to a story or you want to be the only person to have that story. Mm. But to go that far and withhold that information, knowing that there's potentially a lot more people that could die mm -hmm. if he doesn't get arrested. It's mm -hmm. just uh, in, insanity. Yeah, it's, it's completely unethical in my opinion. Um, yeah, 100%. Yeah. It's people's lives. Are just not, you're not just putting your life at risk. You're putting, there are other women that will die if you, if you don't you know, say something. It's completely unethical. When it comes to his arrest again, so he was apprehended after being shot. Mm. Um, I know he was then taken to hospital and okay. he was found to have uh, HIV and TB. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, do you think he was trans that was transmitted from his parents at birth, or do you think he got that from the assaults on his victims? So it's believed that he got that. Um, so one thing that I, I failed to mention about his um, f first period in prison was that he was he claims to have been sexually assaulted in prison. 
Um, and it's believed he either contracted it there or he contracted it in his in in his initial rapes. Um, sadly, he, he actually was aware of his HIV status. Um, he did not inform his wife of his HIV status and he gave her uh, HIV as well, as well as their daughter. Um, so that's, as far as I'm concerned, another two victims. You know, I think, I mean, if he'd had, he had to have caught it, um, you know, sort of, during that prison period or just before that because we didn't have antiretrovirals in South Africa for a very long time and if he'd had it since a child, he probably would not have lived to that age. Mm. So it had to have been either his initial rape victims or he contracted it in, in prison. prison when he was sexually assaulted himself. So one of the, the things that I heard was that there was a detective called Pete Bailerfeld. Ba- <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I mean, we mentioned this before, but I swear, someone should cut up all of the times that I get names <laughs> wrong and just put it on YouTube or something. Um, so he was a police officer or de- a detective. Correct. Um, and I think he's known for being incredibly successful at what he does. Mm. Um, I heard that he had a 99% success rate mm. um, and that he took down some of the biggest serial killers and criminals in South African history. Mm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about him and his involvement in this case? Pete Spalefeld is pretty much a legend, um, you know, in, uh, you know, serial killer academic um, circles and, and in SAPs. He was very well respected by many of his colleagues. He was an excellent detective. Um, it worked in murder and robbery in Hillbrow, which is, you know, I mean, that's, Hillbrow was, even then was a pretty serious area to be working murder and robbery in. And he earned himself this reputation of almost the, you know, like serial killer whisperer because he just had this knack. He was like, he was a really down to earth guy. And he had this knack of getting into the minds of serial killers and almost making them his friends um, to a certain extent. You know, so where he was really, really good was in those post arrest interviews where they know this guy is the 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 serial killer suspect and they just need to get him to admit it and someone to break them down and kind of make them feel comfortable yeah 100 percent. and that's exactly what you know through lots of uh, you know different and strange means i mean one serial killer pit bailafelt had a bra with on the side of the road when he was bringing him back you know from uh, kzn to johannesburg um, that was his way of getting the guy to to trust him. So it was really, I think, for him about building trust. And the more he interacted with these guys, the more he came to understand how their minds worked. And I think, you know, even at that time, the, you know, there was no formal serial killer training that happened shortly after. He, Pete had already built up this repertoire of skills just from doing so many of these interviews. You know, so he became really famous for um, being able to to get into the minds of these guys and get confessions. Yeah, um, I heard that a lot of people from Scotland Yard and mm. uh, those kind of places would often call him for advice or to mm. kind of chat about cases. So certainly um, Pete Bailafelt as well as um, Mickey Pistorius, who was the head of the um, investigative psychology units at the time, Something, you know, interesting that a lot of people don't know about South Africa is with this rise of serial killers that we had in the early 90s, we were either going to get totally overridden by these serial killers or we were going to build one of the best serial killing, uh, serial killer finding machines in the world. And that's exactly what we did. So South Africa's investigative teams and skills and knowledge in terms of tracking and arresting seri- and identifying serial killers it are really, we're some of the, we are one of the best in the world. Um, the FBI, um, as you said, Scotland Yard, many of those organizations contact South African, um, you know, investigators like Bailafelt, um, Mickey Pistorius, Gerard Labaskachny when he joined to get advice on how to, to run these investigations because we had to be really good at it. And we, we became really, really good at catching serial killers. And how do you think we became good? Because we don't have the resources that mm. the FBI, Scotland Yard, we don't have those kind of resources. Um, so I think 
when it comes to South Africa, you have to almost rely on just pure investigation. Mm. Because, you know, we don't have drones flying up in the air. Mm. I don't know if we have access to satellites or that kind of stuff. (laughs) But um, what do you think made the detectives so good at what they do? So I think it was a few things. And one of the things that we, that is actually a huge benefit to our law enforcement in South Africa, if we compare ourselves to a country like America, which we always look to as the gold standard of sort of investigation. Mm. In America, their law enforcement departments are completely separate. There's no connections between any of these um, departments. So serial killers in America will kill in one state, dump in another state and get away with it. Whereas in South Africa, all of our entire country falls under the SAPS. It falls under one office. So, so SAPS is South African Police Service. Correct. Just for the people yes. that are watching that aren't from South Africa. <laughs> Thank you. That's correct. Yeah, South African Police Service. And um, so there's a lot closer sharing of information. You know, and that's often what we see in a lot of these these crimes is even though these guys do concentrate on areas, they will sometimes kill in different provinces, different towns, that sort of thing. And it's always this close sharing of information between SAPS officers that ends up being a benefit to us. So I think that's one way that we were able to do this. Mm. I think a very clever move, which a lot of other countries sort of did after us, is set up the investigative psychology unit. And that is, you know, recognizing that there are crimes that are not motivated by money and there are things that make those crimes different. And, you know, then we had uh, Mickey Pistorius, who was our country's first profiler, and she was trained by people from the FBI. And she ended up, after all of this knowledge that she gained, training some of their guys as well. You know, so that was a big move in South Africa's sort of successful investigation of these types of crimes was setting up that investigative psychology unit. And as much as we, I mean, in 1994, we were still pretty behind on the DNA front. Um, You know, even now we are pushing to get DNA databases going and active and all of that. So it's really interesting how our the people in our country who are committed to solving crime were committed to gaining that kind of knowledge. And that knowledge sharing that happened, I think that was really the biggest thing that that helped us to become, you know, one of the best nations on earth at, at solving these crimes. And getting back to Moses, um, so after he was arrested and shot and put into hospital, um, I'm sure a trial ensued mm-hmm. and... Uh, After that trial, he was sentenced. Can you tell me a little bit about his sentence Mm. and um, how long he was sentenced for? Mm. So it's an interesting sentence because the death penalty had just fallen when Moses Atoli went to trial. And we know the judge said in his his judgments in passing down sentence that if he had still had access to the death penalty and as a sentence, he would have no problem sentencing Moses Atoli to death. And... The South African law, law, you know, our, our criminal law system has changed so much since the early 90s that his sentence is almost, it's, it's very different than anything else we've ever seen. And the first reason for that is, you know, his total sentence was something ridiculous like 2,410 years. Yeah, 2,410 years, um, yeah. which is unbelievable, I mean. Which is, you know, and and that is accumulation of all of his victims, um, you know, all of the the separate number of, numbers of years he got for each victim. Fair enough. But in South Africa, we don't serve our sentences um, con- concurrently. consecutively. We, yeah. we, co- we serve them concurrently. No, I think it's the other way around. No. Or oh, is it in this case it was the other way around? Yes. Yeah, so that yeah. So okay. in this case, in this case, it was the other way around, and that's why Moses' sentence is so strange, because in most other ca- in in almost all other cases, a criminal is given a life sentence of twenty five years. They will serve twenty. They, they will serve that time, even if they're given multiple life sentences. They weren't. They won't. They won't, they won't serve twenty five years and then start their new sentence. Mm. They serve it all at the same time. Whereas in Moses's case, the judge's judgments 
almost made it seem as though that would not be the case. And that seems to have stuck. Um, you know, he gave him a non-parole period, which is another aspect of, of law, which is interesting, of 800 years or something to that effect. He could only apply for parole after 800 years. And that's another thing that's interesting about how they sentenced him is although judges do have the ability to recommend a non-parole period, that actually means nothing when they, once they, they go under the Department of Correctional Services. Um, that ruling sort of falls by the wayside mm. and the two-thirds of the sentence ruling comes in, which is Department of Correctional Services. So Moses' sentence was quite weird. And look, even if he had been sentenced under the way we sentence today with him having to serve, you know, um, concurrent sentences, there's a very slim chance he would ever get out of jail. Um, but I do think that Moses' sentence and the way the judge structured that was a flash in the pan and probably something we won't ever see again. Yeah, I mean, so I've actually got from, I think it was Wikipedia, mm. the actual information about the sentencing. So it says, on the 5th of December 1997, uh, Moses Satoli was sentenced to 50 years imprisonment for each of the 38 murders, mm. 12 years imprisonment for each of the 40 rapes, and five years imprisonment for each of the six robberies. A judge observed that Satoli would be required to serve at least 930 years before being eligible, eligible for parole, mm -hmm. making him eligible for parole at the age of 963. <laughs> I mean, that is... Uh, yeah. That's um, crazy. Yeah, and, you know, it's... Very deserved, though. Very deserved. And I think, um, you know, it was something the public would have wanted to hear. Um, I think that if, you know, today we have the Minimum Sentences Act, um, which makes, you know, we've got life sentences that are very different from how things were structured then. And really, you know, our sentencing today actually has more teeth than sentencing then. Um, a lot of the crimes I've seen in the early 90s, not, not the likes of Moses Atoli, but they were really short sentences, um, you know, whereas today we would see people being given life sentences. Back then they were given 10 years, you know, and they were back on the street in five. Mm. Um, you know, so I think the Minimum Sentences Act has really um, been a benefit to South African, you know, so society. Um, but yeah, certainly I think Moses' sentence will go down in history as one of the the, the biggest, probably. One of the longest ever, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sure it's the longest in South African history. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, longest cumulative and certainly the longest period that a judge has said um, he would get non-parole for. And what prison was he put into? So he was originally put into Pretoria C-Max prison. Um, and then at some point he was moved to Mangaun in uh, Bloemfontein, which is also a... Um, a maximum security prison. And he was very angry about that because he said that that stopped him from being able to see his family and he tried to take the Department of Correctional Services to court and all sorts of things. Um, but to my knowledge, he is still in Bloemfontein. So he is still alive? To my knowledge, yes. Um, I'm pretty sure we would have heard if he had passed away. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult in South Africa, you know, in America, you can go online and see where any offender is in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have access to that information in South Africa. You have to know where the prisoner is in order to phone, hopefully have the phone answered and eventually find, and you have to have the inmate number to find out if an inmate is imprisoned in a specific prison. When it comes to his imprisonment, has there been any updates on him? The one that stands out in my memory was, I think, just, uh, it was actually just after he was sentenced. So I think it was 97, 98. And a journalist decided that she wanted to write a book on his crimes and his life. And he had been turning away journalists left, right and centre. And for some w reason, well, I think I, I very well know the reason, the, the journalist that contacted him was a black female. And he agreed to see her. Um, this journalist went and sat down with him and started this project, uh, this book. And very soon she started to realize that she was in way over her head. Uh, he started sending her, so, they, so because she couldn't always go to prison, she'd given him a postal address so that they could communicate by, by letter to help this process go along quicker. And he'd started sending her really 
um, you know, controlling letters where he, he just showed his manipulation. And she felt controlled by this man even though he was in prison. Um, you know, so the, at that point she ended the project and and that was it. Um, and I think that was that was pretty much the last I saw of him in the news. Um, it's quite surprising that he's been so quiet, actually. I know that you spoke to one of his pen pals. Mm. First of all, I find it insane that <laughs> anyone can just write into a serial killer mm. and have them respond to you. Yeah. Um, I find it such a strange thing. Mm. Um, what did she have to say? And I think that a conversation around why people want contact with killers mm. and why people are sometimes attracted to serial killers. I mean, mm. before we get into the pen pal, why do you think that is? Why do you think people are so fascinated and kind of find them attractive? Mm. So I think that's, you know, the fascination around serial killers has always been there. Um, and some people tend to think it might be cool to be able to send a letter to them and see what they say back. But the truth is that you're you're communicating with a person who doesn't think on your level. They think on you know you're not co you're not communicating with a buddy. You're communicating with a person who sees you as a resource. Um, that's all they see you as. They don't see you as a human being to communicate with and have lovely little letters with. You're just a resource to them. You're a person on the outside who can get them what they want and someone that can manipulate and, you know, so that that's the negative side of it. Now, you know, we know that there are a lot of women who's, and men who seem to gravitate towards having almost romantic feelings towards some of these people that have been convicted of these horrendous crimes. And often those people come from abusive childhoods themselves um, or they've been victims of, um, you know, domestic violence situations and things like that. So there is already a mindset there of being a fixer, of being the person who can help this this man who has lost his way. And, you know, so there, there's certainly a psychological element to it. Mm. I don't for a minute think that it's, women that, you know, there may be a few that get off on this type of thing, that think it's, you know, attractive or sexy that someone, that a man has raped and murdered 40 women. I think it's often a very complex psychological mix that the and the minute these guys see this, they, they just, you know, to them it's Christmas. Um, you know, here's this woman or if it's a, ma a female offender, this man, whatever it may be, that I can control. And they're already in a controllable state, you know. So I think that's why a lot of this happens. Um, and I guess just probably curiosity. And I know, I mean, for, for Charmaine, which I'll talk about now, you know, she, for her, it was, was really curiosity. And yeah, I mean, can you tell me, I know you interviewed one of his mm. pen pals. Yeah. Um, what was that experience like? What did she have to say? So I'd known Charmaine, um, Charmaine O'Neill before I interviewed her. And then when she saw I covered this case on my podcast quite a few years back, she said, oh, um, uh, you know, she was pen pals with Moses Satoli at some time. <laughs> and it was quite interesting. That's quite a coincidence. <laughs> so, I mean, I know Charmaine to be a very um, level-headed, down-to-earth person. And the interesting thing to understand about Charmaine, Charmaine is that prior to that, she'd actually been working with some NPOs, with people in correctional services. Um, so I think her approach to it was a little bit different from a person who, who has no idea what a prison's like and what prisoners are like sending a letter to some inmates. You know, she knew very well what she was getting herself into. And for her, it was really just curiosity. She'd read about his crimes and she said to me at one point, she wanted to sit across from him and look at, her, at his hands to see what the hands of a man looks like that can do something like that, that can snuff out... 37, 40, however many it really was, lives with his own hands, you know. So I guess I think for her it was a sense of almost morbid curiosity, um, but she also ended up getting herself in and she admits that 
deeper than than she she realized. Um, she had a very similar experience to the journalist, where as soon as he started feeling comfortable with her, he started using very inappropriate language in um, letters he sent her, and just made her feel really, really mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Um, and she quickly shut that down. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. And I mean, just before we end off, I know that obviously you've got your own shows and your own podcasts, and I know you just released a book. Mm. Um, tell us what you're up to and where people can find you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, so I've got the True Crime South Africa podcast, um, which is on all the podcast platforms, Spotify, um, Apple. And then I've recently started my new podcast series, which is called I Live Through This which is survival stories of all kinds. Um, there are a few criminal situations, but, you know, things like uh, a man who survived 20 minutes wrestling a crocodile and, and lived through it, you know, all sorts of different stories told by the survivors. And then my book has just been released in October. The, it's called Samurai Sword Murder, the Mornay Haramsa story. And um, that's my first book, true crime book, published under my name. And yeah, that's that's doing very well. I'm very happy with the book. It's re really uh, received really good feedback, and hopefully, some more of those in the future. Well, awesome. I mean, you're doing incredible things. And I mean, before this, before I kind of started doing research into true crime and yeah. the the space in South Africa, I mean, I can see that you're definitely one of the leaders, or you are leading the way. Thank you. Um, and it's just so cool to speak to someone else in this industry. Mm. Um, I yeah. think in South Africa, it's growing, mm. but. Uh, I think we're we're all pretty separated at the moment, or at mm. least I am. So yeah. it's been a pleasure, and you're just incredibly knowledgeable. Thank you. Um, it was a yeah, it was just awesome chatting to you. Great show, uh, absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Josh. Awesome, and thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to to like, subscribe, and uh, comment your thoughts below. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I'll see you all very soon. Cheers. <laughs>